Hello and welcome to the Virtual African Bird Fair. This is the International Vulture Awareness Day session. We'll be starting off with BirdLife South Africa's Linda Funden Heffer, followed up by a panel discussion hosted by Merlin and Cornwall, and she'll be joined by Zoe Greenberg, Katie Fallon, and Anisha Porcarell. Good day, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the Virtual African Bird Fair, which this year also falls on International Vulture Awareness Day. My name is Linda van den Jeffer and I manage BirdLife South Africa's Vulture Project, which is part of the Landscape Conservation Program. Before I hand things over to my colleagues in Zimbabwe, I just want to give you a brief overview of what BirdLife South Africa is currently doing in the vulture conservation sphere. Um, our work mainly focuses on two aspects related to vulture conservation. That is the research and mitigation of the impact of lead poisoning in South Africa's vulture species, as well as the implementation of vulture safe zones in regions that are key to vulture survival. The fact that vultures are in big trouble should not be news to anyone. Three of South Africa's nine vulture species are regarded as critically endangered, and a further two are regarded as endangered by the IUCN. The main reason for this is poison in its various forms. Um, poachers either target vultures intentionally when they lace um, carcasses of animals with poison to prevent detection, or vultures are deliberately targeted when they are harvested for belief-based use. Unfortunately, um, vultures also become the unintentional victims of farmers when poison is used to um, control predators such as caracal or jackal. And um, an aspect that has received increasing attention in recent years is the unintentional impact of lead poisoning on vultures. And BirdLife South Africa is currently conducting a number of research projects in this field. A number of years ago, BirdLife South Africa launched a nationwide assessment of lead poisoning in South Africa's vulture species. To do this, we collected a number of blood and bone samples from a wide variety of individuals, ranging from chicks to adults. And we collected most of the samples from South Africa's gyps vultures, that is the cape and whiteback vulture. But we didn't stop there. To see if this was a problem that was unique to vultures, we also sampled other raptors such as Gymnogene and Barrow's eagle, and even a couple of large terrestrial birds such as Cory Busted and Blue Crane. And our results suggested that lead poisoning was indeed a problem that is unique to vultures. As you can see from the graph there, um, the lead levels that we found in Cape and Whiteback vultures were significantly higher than those found in non-vulture species. So vultures are exposed to a source of lead not available to non-vulture species, which led us to believe that this is possibly linked to their scavenging lifestyle. We believe vultures are exposed to lead poisoning when they consume carcasses that have been shot with lead ammunition. On the left there, you can see two radiographs of springbok that have been shot with lead core bullets. And it clearly illustrates the level of fragmentation that a bullet undergoes when it hits its target. The lead comes from a variety of sources, um, mostly from gut piles and carcasses that have been put out at so-called vulture restaurants. And these carcasses can be the result of wildlife management practices or from hunting and culling operations. So due to the risk of these um, lead fragments to vultures, BirdLife South Africa actively promotes the use of lead-free ammunition. The second half of BirdLife South Africa's Vulture Project focuses on the implementation of vulture safe zones. This was an action that was called for by the Multi-Species Action Plan to Conserve African Eurasian Vultures, which was published in 2017. A vulture safe zone is basically a form of stewardship where we approach owners of large tracts of land and convince them to manage their properties in ways that are friendly to vultures. This involves a number of criteria that can include things like protecting vultures from disturbance during the breeding season, providing the birds with carcasses that are lead and contaminant free, only using lead free ammunition for hunting and culling purposes, not using poison as a deterrent for mammalian scavengers, uh, to modify water reservoirs to prevent drownings, to work with power producers to retrofit unsafe electricity pylons, to prevent the loss of large trees, to monitor vulture populations, and to report any mortalities to BirdLife South Africa, and also to undergo poison response training and not to use 
non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to treat wild animals. In 2019, we declared our first ultra safe zone at the beautiful Tualu Kalahari Reserve in the Northern Cape Province. And since then, we've launched a number of projects to expand the initiative even further. This year, in celebration of International Vulture Awareness Day, we are very pleased to announce the declaration of the new Zululand Vulture Safe Zone. Here, 14 landowners have agreed to safeguard some of the most important breeding habitat of whiteback vultures in the Zululand area. Hi, everyone, and welcome to 2020's Virtual African Bird Fair. This is the International Vulture Awareness Day segment, and my name is Marilyn Nomsankomo. Since the year 2014, when I fell in love with vultures, I decided the next year to start uh, a seminar series that is annual. This is the sixth installment, and this year it's a webinar. And I'm so grateful and happy to have my friends and sisters in vulture conservation, and we all have something in common, and that is our love for writing, outside our love for birds and conservation. With me today is Zoe Greenberg from the very cold and rainy Washington state in the US. And we have Katie Fallon, an amazing author and mom, and have Anisha Pokarel from Nepal. I'm privileged to have these ladies as my friends and more privileged to learn from them about their writing experiences. As we all know that science communication is the right hand of conservation. We scientists need to learn to communicate about such important things and trans as vulture conservation and translate our love and translate our work to change perceptions and opinions of people and rally support for unloved species such as um, vultures. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Katie, who's going to start us off with a talk about her writing and her work. Well, thank you very much um, for inviting me to participate um, in this webinar. I'm very excited to be part um, of the uh, virtual African Bird Fair. Um, and I'm always excited to talk about vultures, um, one of my favorite subjects, um, like you other ladies. Uh, they're just amazing birds that unfortunately don't have the most amazing um, reputations. So uh, my name is, again, Katie Fallon, and I live uh, here in the eastern United States um, in a state called West Virginia. And I am very fortunate that I get to work with vultures um, every day. Uh, in 2017, I wrote a book called Vulture, The Private Life of an Unloved Bird, and it just was republished um, with a new publisher and a new cover that you're seeing here. Uh, and that is a beautiful turkey vulture on the cover. Um, we have two species of vultures in the Eastern US, uh, turkey vultures and black vultures. Um, both are just amazing uh, charismatic, beautiful birds that uh, don't have a great reputation. Um, you notice the subtitle, The Private Life of an Unloved Bird. Uh, and they're not really unloved. Um, there are people who love them. A few of our other possible subtitles were um, Vulture, Eat Your Heart Out, <laughs> uh, and uh, Vulture, you know, Happy Entrails to You. Um, but we went with Unloved Bird, um, even though they do have a lot of fans. A lot of what I wrote about in the book um, comes from my work at a nonprofit, non governmental organization called uh, the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia, uh, which is a very long uh, name. And we mostly just say ACCA instead of saying out all of those words. Uh, our organization's mission is to conserve the region's wild birds uh, through research education and rehabilitation. We do all species of native migratory birds, not just vultures, but of course the vultures are uh, my favorite. Um, these are uh, two beautiful uh, turkey vultures that are residents here at the ACCA. Uh, this is 
Lou and Boris. Uh, Lou is the one on the right, and he's kind of one of the stars of my vulture book. Um, he's a shy turkey vulture, uh, and we um, I've spent a lot of many, many hours working with him um, so he can be an educational ambassador for vultures everywhere. And his uh, roommate is Boris, a female turkey vulture, and I'll talk um, more about them in a minute. And I also want to mention uh, this bird. This is Maverick the black vulture. We have more turkey vultures uh, where I live than we do black vultures. Some of the differences between the two species, they get kind of confused and lumped together a lot um, by uh, people who are watching them and might not realize the differences. Turkey vultures have these brownish black feathers where black vultures are more solid black. Turkey vultures have that uh, adorable pinkish red face. Um, and black vultures have that um, kind of grayish face. It can be a little confusing if you're looking at a young turkey vulture uh, because they have a gray face until they're, you know, at least a year old. Um, but we see some of both species here at the ACCA um, in, in rehabilitation. Uh, this is a turkey vulture um, radiograph. And we're, if we're talking about writing and telling stories about vultures, I mean, the story of this particular vulture who came in for rehab is very sad. If you can see the kind of circular shaped white, um, bright white objects, the ones that are shaped like a circle are shotgun pellets. So this bird was shot, which uh, we still see turkey vultures every year um, shot, even though they are federally protected species and it is against the law to shoot them. So this bird was shot with a shotgun um, turkey vultures are obligate scavengers, um, so they're not killing livestock or hurting anything. They're eating dead animals. There's no reason to, to shoot them or harm them. And then the, the kind of bright white objects in this bird's digestive tract um, are little bits of metal that the bird inadvertently ate. Uh, we see birds that are suffering from lead poisoning. Uh, this is a young turkey vulture um, in rehabilitation suffering from lead poisoning. They can get lead poisoning a few different ways. One way is if they eat parts of an animal that had been shot with a lead bullet. Um, lead bullets will sometimes fragment and the vultures will swallow big chunks of that uh, meat and swallow the lead and not realize it and it can make them sick, even though turkey vultures can handle a lot more lead um, than other species. Uh, I mentioned um, that we, education is one of the missions of our nonprofit. Um, this is Boris the turkey vulture. Um, you can see just how big turkey vultures are um, right next to me. <laughs> um, they have about a six foot wingspan. Um, Boris usually weighs uh, about 2000 grams. Um, or uh, I think that's four, four or so pounds, um, four or five pounds. And she it was a bird that was shot. Um, she came in for rehabilitation. She was found in someone's yard and she couldn't fly. Uh, and she unfortunately can't return to the wild because of her injuries. Um, so when we tell the stories, the story about Boris um, and about turkey vultures, and we always mention that they do very important ecosystem service. Uh, cleaning up dead animals. Um, turkey vultures can actually uh, eat animals that have died of rabies um, or anthrax or botulism toxin, and turkey vultures can eat those diseases and stop the spread of disease. Uh, this is Lou the turkey vulture um, at an educational program. And uh, you'll notice Lou is kind of free wandering around without any equipment on, um, which sometimes makes, makes me nervous, but uh, he's a fairly shy turkey vulture. He comes out of his carrier, stands on his perch, um, and then he goes back in usually. Um, uh, but we emphasize during our presentations, and I try to write about it, how important these birds are to ecosystems, even though they have this, you know, reputation as eating dead things, um, you know, making, reminding people of death things like that. Uh, this is just a very quick video of Maverick the Black Vulture. I actually took this video this morning and I thought it would be uh, cool to show you today. Um, outside of our enclosures, we have a, a hall, an enclosed hallway that 
to prevent accidental escape and Maverick, who was hit by a car and uh, can't fly well enough to return to the wild, loves to spend time um, with our trainers and our, our human educators kind of running around in the hallway. He's eating dead mice there. Um, and he's just a, a really neat bird. Everybody who meets this bird um, loves him. Uh, I think a lot of the problem with the reputation vultures have is that people just don't know them. Um, and if they knew how uh, important they were to the ecosystem and also just how charismatic and interesting as individuals, um, I think a lot more people would, would, would like them. Um, I certainly do. Some of the other work that I get to do with turkey vultures um, that I, I write about in the book, uh, we, the ACCA and a few other organizations partner to do some research on young turkey vultures. We visit nest sites uh, where we where turkey vultures are known to nest. They'll nest in caves, um, in haylofts, uh, sometimes uh, other, other places where they can kind of get inside, big large cavities. Um, we take the babies out of the nest for just a few minutes. This was just a couple weeks ago, so I were all wearing our masks because of the um, pandemic. We take the vultures out of the nest for just a few minutes. We measure them. Um, we, take, we take blood samples to test for lead toxicity. Um, and we put wing tags on the birds. Um, if they're old enough to um, wear the wing tag, they're just floppy floppy, lightweight tags that allow vultures, allow people on the ground to be able to see the vultures uh, and identify them. And then they can report the tags to our federal bird banding lab. And then the bird banding laboratory will get in touch with us and let us know where the bird was sighted. Um, one of our baby turkey vultures from this location was sighted almost a thousand miles away, uh, which was really amazing to think about our little baby turkey vulture um, flying that far. Uh, so um, sometimes um, I give them a little hug <laughs> before I put them back in the nest, maybe a little kiss on the head. Uh, so I think it's really just amazing to get to um, do this research and help these birds, help us learn more about these birds. You'll notice that baby turkey vultures got that gray face that I mentioned that turns red as the birds get older. I don't know if the turkey vultures like getting a little hug from me, but I find them very, very, uh, really adorable. Um, and now I'm kind of getting to the end here um, of my part of the presentation. Um, I'm gonna put my email address up on the screen. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch and talk about turkey vultures ever or writing, um, I'm happy to um, talk to anybody. Uh, this is Handsome Lou, again, who was hit by a car and can't go back to the wild. And there's his roommate, Boris, um, she spends a lot of time uh, preening. This time of year, a lot of our birds are molting um, as they get new feathers in, you know, getting ready to migrate um, or to stay warm in the winter. Uh, and Boris always wants her feathers to be, you know, uh, free of any dirt um, or insects and uh, all, you know, laying perfectly so she can, she can fly if she had to. So again, thank you very much um, for uh, letting me be part of this webinar. I'm really excited to um, hear what everybody else uh, has to say about about vultures. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, when I met Katie, I had been racing through her book because I knew she was going to come to Hawk Mountain and, and uh, do a book reading. And it was for that, that, that time, it was the, my first time reflecting on my personal journey and experiences with individual vultures I had helped rehabilitate and how important those stories are to send across to so many different people so that people get to connect to the world of conservation and its importance. I think sharing that those stories is very important. It disseminates the information far um, from the places we work or the people that actually are in contact with where we, we, we do our work. So it's very commendable work she's doing and writing about it. So the next person who's going to talk to us about her work uh, in impacting young lives uh, for vulture conservation is my girl Zoe and it's over to you Zoe. Thank you Marilyn. So um... I'm going to segue from um, Katie's wonderful presentation 
uh, into a similar avenue of how I fell in love with vultures. And I was at a nature center when I met my first vultures up close. And I um, found that most people looked at vultures um, unfavorably, as Katie mentioned. And I would give programs on vultures and I could tell that most people were looking at vultures as the non-sexy raptors. So there's the hawks and there's the eagles and the falcons and the ones that have this um, sort of natural aesthetic that people are drawn to. And then there are these guys and I find them very charismatic and wonderful and fun to be around and cute and beautiful, but I could tell really quickly that most people didn't and I would get faces like this when I would give presentations. Um, and so it got me thinking, you know, what are the reasons um, why people don't relate to them and how can we change that as a conservation community? And I was lucky enough to um, have the offer to create a curriculum about vultures. And so this was my chance to go from being an interpreter at a nature center who was talking with folks that are already um, predisposed towards caring for the environment. You know, they're coming out to our sort of remote nature center with this um, intent to learn about all raptors, including vultures. Um, but I started thinking about the general public that maybe never sees them and may even see vultures and not recognize um, what they are. Um, or sees them and finds them repulsive, which is what I came across a lot of the time. And I was um, at that point at Hawk Mountain and we had a grant to put transmitters on black vultures um, from Fish and Wildlife. And there was a stipulation in the grant that there needed to be an education component. And so I was lucky enough to get tasked with creating that education component. Um, and part of the reason this money was available is because black vultures have really been expanding their range and there's been increased uh, occurrences of human vulture conflict uh, because they're what we call human commensals. They thrive around human habitation. So that comes with its a whole can of worms of um, problems, you know, pros and cons. People can be near them, but um, this is sort of how this project was born. And so I was given complete autonomy um, with this curriculum and so I started really brainstorming you know what do I want students to get from this experience and I we chose middle school as an age group and so this was a I was designing a curriculum for the classroom and so that's very different than being outside with a bird on the hand um, and there were a lot of challenges and it was it was really fun and so some of the objectives that I came up with where I wanted um, students to get the chance to look at movement ecology data. So real data coming from transmitters that were on birds and learn how to make inferences about the life history of these black vultures from that data. And I chose inferences because middle school age, um, you know, for our public systems here in the United States, that's, you know, they're young, you know, they're, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. And hypotheses are not necessarily in their lexicon yet. They're not looking at science, you know, through experiments quite yet um, a lot of the time, but anybody can look at some data trends and make inferences, you know, look at the implications of what that data says. So I wanted to focus on something that they could um, kind of wrap their head around and then also use critical thinking skills to look at this dynamic between people and vultures and then explain why movement ecology matters when it comes to conservation. Um, and these were terms that I never heard about as a middle school student, you know, movement ecology, conservation science. Um, so I was excited about the idea of, of showing these concepts to students at a, at a younger age. And I also wanted them to feel like they were meeting black vultures as individuals. Um, and as Katie mentioned, you know, the story of these individual birds is really amazing. And when you have a transmitter on a bird and you are looking at their movements, you know, you have this opportunity to take it from the species level to the individual level. And for students, I thought that that would be a really good engagement uh, tactic. And I also wanted to introduce a lot of the natural history of these birds to both the students and the teachers because I was worried that teachers wouldn't be keen on using this curriculum if they felt like they needed to take on this huge research project for a bird that they might already think is ugly in the first place. I wanted it to feel like something they could really um, grab onto, but that they had all the information they needed. So 
I created a PowerPoint that talked about some of these main natural history and life history uh, components. So the roosting behavior, how to tell them apart from turkey vultures, the feeding ecology, what kind of habitats they like and their breeding behavior. Um, so there was a handout for students that was very um, comprehensive and also included vocabulary words such as feeding ecology um, and then a glossary so that they could also be learning some new science terms but then the teachers had access to these same materials with a key to help them teach the natural history part in case they didn't have that background. And then I also wanted to definitely incorporate humor because these are, you know, young kids and their Bird Life International actually created quite a few wonderful comic, comics about old world vultures and some of them are very applicable to the birds we have here. Um, but I just felt that comics would be a good engagement strategy. Um, and also, shockingly, I realized that potty humor, so talking about poop um, or talking about like vomit which you know both of those come up when we talk about vultures fifth grade boys loved this stuff and so i it was a, a really quick in to get these kids excited because they just loved these um kind of gross traits that vultures have they were all about it so that was kind of fun to learn that and be able to use that with students and then i also wanted to help them relate to vultures because that can be a very difficult thing to do and so i wanted to show them that vultures they have kids and they have family and the babies are adorable so even if someone doesn't think an adult vulture is cute how can you look at these babies and not have your heart melt so I also tried to engage them by reminding them that like birds have families too just like we do and they care about their kiddos um, and they have homes in the nest so sort of taking it to those universal relatable concepts um, and then I wanted to move into this idea of movement ecology and really start looking at the data component. And you'll see a wing tag on this picture here, as Katie was mentioning, you know, starting to look at, okay, scientists are studying birds. Why are they doing it? How does this relate to conservation? What is movement ecology? So sort of moving into the nuts and bolts. And I also have a really big soft spot for this data component, because this was some of my first research experiences were tagging vultures. Um, and so I was really excited to take this experience I'd had in the field and apply it to education um, as well. And so I'll show you a couple examples of the way that I um, did this, this data transfer. I made animations of the movement tracks for these individual black vultures. Um, and I used Google Earth and R, which is an open software program. Um, I could not have done this without the help of my friend Wouter Van Steelens. He was at Hawk Mountain at the time. He's one of the founders of the Batumi Raptor Count, but I hate coding. Hated it when I did this, still hate it, but it was extremely useful in creating these animations and I'm really grateful to him for helping show me that. Um, so Gifford was a bird that was tagged and I created this animation to show seasonal movements. So if you look at this animation, there's a time bar up here and this is showing the month of the year and you'll see Gifford staying in the same place but then goes on this little foray out and what I asked the students to do after sort of teaching them how to use Google Earth which is a tech skill that a lot of schools want students to have um, I wanted them to tell me what time of year Gifford was moving and then after that I wanted them to try and answer why why do you think Gifford would have moved further during this time of year which was winter and if they've read the natural history handout and they've been thinking about this critically i mentioned in there that a lot of the time in pennsylvania which is where these schools were that snow covers carcasses and so kind of getting them to look at these animations and and figure out why the bird would be moving that was sort of one of their introductory stories or introductory birds and then I had them look at a bird named Ethan to talk about long-term studies and why it's important to, to study a bird for more than just a week or a day. Um, and this was, Ethan was a bird we had data for um, three, three summers, and this is supposed to say 2016 down there in the blue. And so I'll show you this animation. The purple is the summer of 2014. The green is the summer of 2015. And then the blue is the summer of 2016. And, and what this shows is that the bird was returning to the same place every summer. 
um, the exact same place, more or less. And so I wanted them to explain how those movements relate to this concept of site fidelity, which was a new term for a lot of these students, and then be thinking about how land use by humans could alter Ethan's desire to return. And one thing that was important to me is that I would ask questions that could have multiple answers. And this one here, they could have said it wouldn't alter Ethan's desire to return um, because in the natural history handout, we discussed this human commensal idea and that black vultures do well around a lot of human land use. But of course, there are also some land use um, changes that would negatively alter Ethan's ability to return to this breeding site. So I wanted to give them some leeway in how they answered that. And then the last bird I'll show you is Donald, um, who happened to be a girl we found out later and given the political climate at the time, we were pretty thrilled about that. Um, but Donald was a bird that actually engaged in a short distance migration and black vultures, sometimes they move, individuals will move more than others, which makes them interesting to think about when it comes to movement ecology. And as I play this animation, you'll see the green is the springtime and then the orange is fall. So it was a, a migration, um, or sorry, the, the orange is the summer. So it was a migration that took place over you know, two different seasons. And this was a bird that I thought um, introduced this idea of a longer track and getting them to look at landscape and human made features along this bird's journey. And this also helps them learn how to use Google Earth to zoom in and look at really specific features um, like restaurants, you know, that specific or landfills um, or bodies of water and see if the bird was hanging out to, uh, next to any of these places on purpose. And then inferring how these features might affect um, the lives of black vultures as they move through the landscape. So for example, if there were a ton of restaurants um, on Donald's track and Donald seemed to be hanging out towards those in those areas a lot, maybe it's a food source. Um, or if there's a, a shooting range, for example, how might that affect Donald's choices and where Donald's gonna go, things like that. Um, and then if you were a scientist studying and protecting black vultures, how might this information help you? So getting them to sort of take a step back and think about why the data matters and put themselves in the shoes of a scientist. Um, and I asked this for Donald because Donald showed some interesting choices. She would hang out next, um, in quarries a lot. There were several uh, cases where she was spending a lot of times in quarries and I was trying to help them see that maybe thermal development could be part of the reason for that because of the heat building up over the rocks um, and see if they sort of made that connection. And also Donald spent a lot of time near water and we had also talked about in the natural history section that individuals will sometimes develop um, an affinity for certain food sources. So it could have been fish guts, you know, fishermen offloading their gut piles, things like that, because um, Donald spends a lot of time near water. So again, sort of taking that story piece. Um, and then after looking at those individual birds, they have this chance to sort of apply the knowledge by answering some bigger questions about the whole data set. So they actually looked at five birds um, and answered a lot of these questions. And then um, towards the end of the unit, getting them to think about it holistically. So how would you summarize the movement ecology of black vultures that you met during this lesson? And then take a moment and think about how the people in your life feel about vultures. And does, does um, this perception of vultures uh, affect their survival. So getting them to think about how the way humans see a species might affect that species ability to survive. And I want to share one response I got. This was from a sixth grader because I found it, I mean, I cried when I read some of these just because I was really happy that I was getting these some kind of profound responses. Um, but she tied it into DDT. So she sort of said, you know, think about how much power humans have to wipe out um, a species and think about DDT, that was because we wanted to get rid of bugs. And I love this part um, later down where she says, you know, you need to think, why does this animal deserve to die? Because they accidentally crawled into my house because they're creepy looking? No, that is not in any way a valid reason. <laughs> so she was really, um, she was a very uh, kind of riled up about this idea that you can't just kill something because it doesn't look good. You know, you got to think further than that. So I was just happy to see that that was sort of her take on this application of the data. 
And then in the conclusion of the lesson, getting them to think about sort of the more conservation and management aspect of, is it anyone's role to protect vultures? And if so, whose? Um, and what would happen if we didn't have vultures? So then thinking about the ecological implications of a vultureless world. Um, and then also asking them what they think about data visualization. So why did I give you animations instead of a static map or a lecture or a paragraph explaining how each bird moves? And I got one response that I also, or I got many responses I loved, but this one I'm going to highlight that this um, student was mostly saying, it's kind of hard to read, but he says, you know, let's say you open up your, your computer and you show students the route. Um, if they see the track, they might look at, you know, Donald's track and say, hey, I've been there. I've been to the Chesapeake Bay. I know where that quarry is. I probably saw that vulture there. And then they feel closer um, and they're more likely to go to that track and to see black vultures and feel more connected to nature. So that was sort of his take on why data visualization can help people connect. And I was like, yes, bingo. That's what I think it does too. Um, so it was very, very heartwarming to see these responses. This was a pilot I did in a sixth grade class. Um, and it was, it was fun. So I just want to sort of emphasize that I really think that curriculum can help these rarely loved birds like vultures, but it doesn't have to be something crazy with a bunch of animations and data. It can also just be coming up with questions that tie science and education together, you know, and I created a couple extensions in this curriculum that were for younger kids. Um, they read a children's book about vultures and then they talked with older kids about so the older kids would kind of facilitate a conversation with the younger students about conservation um, and then some you know giving some students the option to write a poem or write a story about Gifford based on the animations they saw so there's lots of ways to take these concepts of mixing all these disciplines together you can take those those different approaches and turn it into something that works for wherever you are and whoever your audience is. Um, but these are some of the big take home messages that I, I found from this experience of creating the curriculum. Um, one of them being that creating a culture of appreciation around all raptors, no matter what they look like, is a really powerful message um, and something that I care a lot about and the students seem to respond to very, very well, in part because a lot of us as people, um, you know, we want to be appreciated regardless of what we look like. And so sort of making that connection of human psychology to also the ethics of how we look at animals. Um, they're very capable, young students are very capable of seeing the validity of that. Um, and then also talking about the fact that vultures here, in the United States and a lot of places, they're everywhere. And so rather than talking about exotic species that aren't anywhere near the students, they're never, they might never be able to see them, talking about the animals in our backyard and the ones that are right now that are common. Um, and also you can then have follow through with your lessons where you're taking the students back out to go see vultures weeks, months after you do this curriculum to keep that follow through going, which in teaching pedagogy is, is important. You know, we always say as teachers that you wanna give them follow through. You wanna keep connecting them to that subject. And then also talking about the ecology of these species that are very easy to ignore, you know, and we can learn from the crisis in the old world that, that vultures matter. They have a huge impact on our ecosystem and we want to appreciate them while they're still common. Um, very, very important. And then also bridging the gap between science and education. And one thing that I, found, I feel is really important as well that I kind of learned through this experience is that we want to attract people, kids, students who are excited about conservation that have skills in science and education. And I think sometimes those students don't know which one to choose. I felt that way. Should I pick science? Should I pick education? Should I be a writer? But if we can think outside the box with our curriculums and our lessons and our nature center programs and cater to people who have skills in multiple fields, then you get these holistic conservationists that can apply all of their skills. And I think that that's really good for a species like a vulture that, you know, needs somebody to be able to tie in the humor and the science and all of it um, instead of looking at it through one lens. So those were the main things that I learned from this. I had so much fun doing it. Um, I 
am happy to talk to anybody who's interested in sort of brainstorming some of the ways to get people excited uh, with education materials. But um, thank you for letting me be part of this and, uh, and letting me share my love of these birds. Wow, thank you, Zoe. So I met Zoe in 2017 when we were both interns and I was a trainee at Hawk Mountain. And I saw her work hard on this uh, curriculum and she was so passionate about it. And so, yeah. I, I learned the importance of a transdisciplinary approach to conservation because she had majored in education and had just graduated and she brought so much insight as how to reach out to kids. And as you can see, her curriculum ties in so many things that we sit for different modules for in university. And all those kids are probably going to grow up and be developers they're going to be legislators one day, some will be accountants, but they will know something about movement ecology, they will know something about habitat loss, they will know a lot about ecology and they'll make their everyday life decisions based on that knowledge they got in their formative years. I think it's very important for conservation to make use of, 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 of other fields like education, and, and do, the, do our best to reach out, especially to the youth of this generation. Uh, up next, we're going to have my very good friend, Anisha, who I'm only meeting today, but have known so closely for four years now. I'm excited to hear about her work and her passion for Asian vultures. Like I said, Anisha is from Nepal and she was, been involved in education and writing. Uh, so Anisha, take it away. Thank you so much. I'm very excited and to be, I think, looking at all the girls. I'm so excited because I always, for me, that is always a very um, fun thing and an encouraging thing is coming back from Nepal, like where it was always hard um, to see many women getting involved in conservation. Uh, I always had, it was a constant struggle, but then you're seeing so many women doing it all around the world is very uplifting and encouraging in the same way. Um, so here it goes, of course, everybody of us loves vultures and uh, my journey has also been somehow very, um, I think that's a coincidence. I was never supposed to be stumbling in natural resource or conservation science. I was meant to be a doctor during my undergrad days. Um, so when I actually uh, was volunteering in my university degree when I was doing my forestry, but majoring on wildlife conservation um, and the city that I was actually studying, uh, was known as the city of vultures and um, we used to uh, with my friends I used to go in this beautiful vantage point where uh, we were at the top of the hill and every evening we would see like um, some vultures and eagles soaring around and I think like just looking at them like with their wings wide open and soaring and it was like eye to eye connection in a way it's very I know very cringeworthy but that's how I was very much um, first attracted to vultures. I'm kind of linking both like science and um, more like how cultural um, aspect also, like because most of the things conservation in Nepal have been very much com community driven. So um, based on my experiences, I've found like, yeah, we all know um, how important they are for ecological aspect, like their role as scavengers. But there's also a lot of other roles that the vultures are serving, like the economic roles through uh, bird watching these days has been a huge um, um, ecotourism attraction. Similarly, in Nepal and Tiba, there's uh, sky burial practices as well, which is like a very spiritual practices um, in the northern um, uh, region, uh, northwestern region of Nepal. Similarly, in terms of like Hindu mythology and traditions, we have had this a vulture as a uh, symbol, like he he was there to protect this goddesses who was being kidnapped by this demon or whatever. So I was explaining about a lot of different um, cultural aspects. So this picture was uh, uh, where they're feeding in the feeding station. And when I talked about um, the sky burials, that's uh, some of the pictures that I got on Google. And this is the, pic the mythological story of how vulture is protecting this um, goddess. We always like um, 
the the way that I've been trying to um, work on when doing my um, working in environment or experiences uh, talking with especially with community was like you just go there and tell they're important they're this uh, you give all the scientific reasons and they are like valid reasons but you know sometimes especially if, like for in Nepal which is still very much like behind in science and thing it's like a way that you can grasp and unite people is also through religion so I've been using all these different aspects to create awareness like see we the vulture was mentioned as like this protector so how how can we have negative aspects towards it and as so we all know about how asian uh, vultures have been like uh, plummeting their, their population decline catastrophically in the late 1990s through this uh, drug um, called diclofenac so it was more of a secondary poisoning uh, and especially in nepal which is still like a lot of population depend on um, raising livestock so when the livestock are sick or all they are treated with this drug diclofenac and uh, when they're like dead so they're mostly cows because generally the populations and the lowlands are like hindus so uh, we wouldn't consume uh, beef uh, because we it's a national animal as well and as per hindu we worship cow as a mother so based on that like the cow dies and we live it but because they're treated with diclofenac all these vultures would come and eat and within some like um couple of days they have this um, um renal um damage and they would die so there was like all this reason uh, uh catastrophic loss of vulture population declined more than like 99 percent in south uh, i think india and south asia and in nepal we have there like, more than 90 percent of decline in uh, vulture populations so knowing like once um the, the decline of vultures have been reported in like um early 2000s um, there have been a lot of conservation effort going on and the transboundary approach because it's a huge thing in all south asia so in 2006 uh, diclofenac, uh, diclofenac was uh, banned uh, in uh, nepal india and pakistan and every year there is this group called save so saving asian vultures from extinction so all this lot of uh, national international local organization come together and and um, discuss about the progress in conservation and so the results across all um, in, uh, nations in south asia which is an amazing way to uh, understand uh, this conservation in more of a trans boundary level so through those things we have in Nepal and in, in other countries as well. So this uh, vulture safe zones where um, we're making sure that the vultures are not being uh, exposed to diclofenac. So even though the, the diclofenac is banned, it's still like the constant, constant monitoring of uh, the areas like the veterinary stores are still uh, done to make sure that there is no diclofenac being sold illegally or anything especially in Nepal um, it's been done uh, a lot of times so this uh, one um, uh, car, uh, horde board that I was um, sewing is like it's one of the vulture feeding station of vulture restaurants in uh, western Nepal um, so those areas are like actually so Nepal has around seven um, community uh, based uh, vulture feeding stations so all those um, areas actually are managed by communities which actually uh, is a, a very, um, I think in Nepal, so look kind of linked back to community forestry had has been huge success in Nepal, like over more than 25 years. So that same approach has been also used in a conservation of wildlife and also endangered species like vultures. So when people are, rather than telling people to conserve, when they themselves are being, um, uh, are the ones are taking care so there is this ownership, there is this more like personalized sentiments and feelings that, okay, we need to conserve, uh, conserve. And that comes through the awareness that cannot just be pretended or just be forced by legislation. So that needs to be uh, more the feeling within. And so it's been very like amazing experience to see that how people uh, who may not have much interest or who may have negative uh, approach towards vultures through awareness through understanding are like on the, um, are themselves uh, playing key role in actually saving vultures 
So I have been lucky. So in my undergrad days, as I was saying, I've been lucky to uh, volunteer in different organizations, which is where my journey towards vulture conservation started as well. And as a part of raising um, awareness among community engagement, we went to schools, we went to like even the communities around the vulture uh, feeding stations outside to tell them why we need to, to give them um, not only because it's uh, not only because it's uh, mentioned by law, but these are the important reasons why we need to understand uh, why vultures are important. So we would go in schools and talk with kids. And the one thing that now like coming back to you, coming to US and seeing so much awesome science communication and neat, like outreach programs, um, I feel like, oh my God, I could do so many different things and be more proactive and interactive than what I used to do back in my initial days. Um, but again, like looking back, even that was still uh, very important. We would have a drawing competition um, for kids and to see how they approach vultures as well. And it was like a very amazing experience. Similarly, uh, we would also, uh, through this, I was volunteering in an organization called Bird Conservation Nepal, and it was a student branch. So we would go and even had training uh, for bird watching tourism to the local uh, youths in that village's area as well. So that, uh, and that area is very rich in bird watching and bird species as well. So young people would find it attractive, not only to be like, oh, we should conserve vultures, but use that or harbor it, harness that as a source of income for the local youths as well. I personally always feel the need to educate and aware a younger like kids and um, especially younger generation because they're gonna be the one who would be having more long lasting impression they're the one who are susceptible to change and that's how they can create change more like it, to make it more sustainable um, so this has been some of my experiences especially on community awareness and engagements as well um, and besides that, like how those uh, uh, vulture restaurant or vulture feeding stations has also um, uh, not only like it's important for science or like because vultures are ecologically important, but how through conserving vultures, they can um, also uh, help themselves, like help in community development. So here, um, uh, some of the organizations, uh, uh, because of all the tourists that would go, um, that would go there and like observe vulture tourism, uh, observe the vultures and feeding, they would uh, donate some money. And based on that, there was this library built in the local, in the surrounding community. Similarly, uh, the carcasses, which is provided in the, in the lowlands, in the so the carcasses before they would um, uh, leave the carcasses to be fed in uh, to be fed by vultures skins would be taken off so they could send those skins to some um, I think musical uh, music in, uh, industry or some like some factory where it would, uh, they could be used in certain ways so they could earn that as some kind of another source of income uh, I would like to share this small video when I was doing my undergrad research in one of the feeding stations, which was just outside um, National Park, uh, the first national park in Nepal. So I was here in a little hide. Um, so I put the camera here and there's this um, cow and you can see a lot of vultures hovering around coming down. Um, yeah, I loved, so I think seeing all those things I know people, I have been vegetarian my whole life and my parents are like, why are you studying all this? Are you not disgusted? But I don't know. I just feel it very fascinating. Um, and I've been attracted to carnivores, scavengers all the time. I don't know why, but um, this was like very cool. Like all these videos that I've taken, some of the videos, I've, even though I've lost some of them or many of them, it was cool to use these videos even um, to some of the school kids to like see them like get excited about vultures. You know, they have like adrenaline, like the boys especially were like, oh my God, this is like about fight or aggression or whatever. So, um, so besides that, um, talking about writing. So as I said, I love, I have interest in literature and writing, but because again, in our society, it's always driven to, oh, you should go to science, you should be doing this and that. And even though I chose that and I have like, um, so much I've learned um, being in this field. I always have this uh, love for writing. So I always try to um, inter, intermix this uh, love that I have towards writing. So some um, this upper one is my uh, 
uh, article that was published in a national and Nepali national daily on vulture. So there's a little snippet of it. And similarly, I think about vulture awareness um, and see them in the wild, which is amazing. But then getting to have that close up uh, encounter, close up way to look at them is also like very much um, important in terms of raising awareness and creating that sentiment of like, okay, these are important. You've got to know more about them. So in a way, I think that has also changed me. Similarly, the obviously the scientific, uh, in a way like scientific um, communication through um, um, paper publishing and writing, there's all these another aspect that I don't want to um, go about. But as I said, like all this thing in a way we're raising awareness and um, uh, communicating about how vultures are important, how we can um, how we can communicate to every level, like from grass to local levels to the scientific level about what's happening on vultures and what needs to be done. Similarly, when I came to Hawk Mountain, I got this amazing opportunity to learn more about movement ecology, migration, and that has like opened a whole plethora of things for me. Um, and that all actually inspired me to create this children's book that I published in March this year. Um, so based on my experiences and everything that I have always wanted to write something, I didn't know I would write a children's book, but it was actually due to, um, uh, as a part of the course that I took, which integrated like um, science, um, uh, educating people through science or something like that, and where I got to create this amazing children's book. So the story is more based on um, this friendship between a stapy eagle and vulture and and in a way that they're talking about how people pursue them or like how people think about them, perceive them and what can be done. So it's a very beautiful, um, um, beautiful story about the friendship between these birds, but mostly trying to raise awareness about why you should um, think about vultures, especially now in time of COVID of like how sanitization uh, sanitation is important and how vultures have been doing uh, as a nature's cleanup crew they have been doing it um, for free so why why wouldn't you why would you underestimate these birds as well but all this thing I also like to discuss include a little bit of challenges that are faced um, there is a lot of um, lack lack of resources uh, back in Nepal uh, with community engagement and education there's also this lack of resources as well which needs to be addressed similarly the other thing that i see is like unlike here i think in nepal there's still very lack of less publicity on um like vulture feeding station and eat as ecotourism uh, ecotourism spot like every time when people think of nepal it's like yeah mountains or wildlife but then like of course yeah we have vultures we have this cool amazing thing cool amazing project uh, projects going on as well so that also needs to be integrated in our um conservation works as well and then of course the lack of expertise and uh, gap in knowledge sharing is something as well which i've seen like there are few people in the top and like to push to like go through the younger generation it's uh, yeah it's somewhat hard and it's like uh, there's a lot of politics there's corruption and everything involved in the whole thing which makes it very challenging for like young independent people to try to go and learn or share their knowledge as well to include like i think the vulture in nepal or in asia's vulture conservation is going towards the right direction but yeah there's still a long way to go and we have so many things to do a um, lot of work needed in still education and raising awareness and the one thing that i never leave in any conversation is the gender balanced conservation because um uh, being a woman as i said like very few women are encouraged in the field and even if there it's a very like male dominated field back in nepal and um it's very hard to get mentors very hard to go in field works or even like research projects there's a long a lot of things that needs to be done but the most important thing is we all love vultures and we need to work towards the conservation. So in closing, I would like to say just um, how much I've learned from knowing you guys. I was inspired uh, by all of you in different ways in my writing journey.
I started my blog after reading a lot of things you'd, you'd written, Anisha, in 2017 and writing about my field work and experiences up close with vultures. I was very inspired by your book, Katie. And just going to schools and having interaction with kids, Zoe, that really inspired me, showing kids how science literally works. So I'm very grateful for the interactions we've had and the talks that you've uh, come through with. Thank you.